Hey, good evening, guys. How's everybody doing? Uh, this is your host, Rocco, again. Thanks for coming back to the channel and joining me for another album review. Now, I hope you liked uh, last week's video on Vandergraaff Generators from H to HE album, because we got another VDGG classic coming your way today with their first true album, The Least We Can Do Is Wave To Each Other. I know, weird and long song title. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been having this VDGG kick lately, that's actually awkward to say. I'm just going to call them Vandergraaff from now on. And, uh, you know, they're, as I mentioned in the previous video, if you guys saw that one, uh, Vandergraaff, it, it's a band that, you know, I absolutely love. They're one of my all-time favorite progressive rock bands. And one of those bands that kind of really seems to slip under the radar for most people. But it isn't music that you want to listen to on a daily basis. This isn't something you just put on in the background, chill out, relax to, work out to, you know, just going about your day-to-day -day activities. This is music you got to be in the mood for. you got to be in the mood for the darkness, the insanity. And you got to sit your ass down and fucking focus and listen to it. Because Vandergraaff really demands 100% of your mental capacity. Kind of like King Crimson in that sense. I find that those two progressive rock bands in particular, not that they're hard to get into. I would say this is hard to get into. King Crimson, like that band is just, I don't know, for me it didn't really take much to get into King Crimson. At least like their classic period. Some of their al other albums might have been a bit challenging. But VDGG in particular, you got to sit your ass down and really focus because... They're a very eccentric, out there band, and their albums are usually just dark from start to finish. There's a few lighter moments here and there, a few comedic moments, especially in their later years, in their 2000s resurgence, which is actually really awesome, by the way. I'm definitely going to review that one of these days. But uh, for the most part, it can be a hard listen. And uh, Peter Hamill's vocals, definitely hard to digest at points. He's very dramatic, which is what I love about him. But uh, he does these, he sings in a British accent, with, which might be hard for some of the Americans to really get into. And uh, just gets really intense and really just out there at moments, really manic at points. So, you know, and the music's not easy to get into whatsoever. There's a lot of time changes, but not only that, a lot of dissonance as well. And a lot of unexpected, jarring, heavy, dark moments. One of the heaviest bands. So, needless to say, all of that could just be summarized by... When I listen to this band, I usually listen to it in bursts. Like, I gotta be in the mood for it. I sit my ass down for a week or two, or sometimes three, and just listen to these albums over and over again. Satisfies me, and then I can go, like, months and months without listening to them again before, like, the kick comes back. Whereas Genesis, yes, any any day of the week, just throw on a fucking Genesis album, like Foxtrot, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, and just enjoy. But not this band. But don't, don't get me wrong, guys. This band is no worse than Genesis, Yes, or King Crimson. This is one of the greatest progressive rock bands of all time. So that's kind of my little intro on them. If you guys want more of a detailed history of how I got into Vandergraaff and just the history of the band in general, definitely check out the previous video on my channel, uh, the From H to HE review, which was their second album. I, I kind of go more in depth with that one because that was the album that got me into the band and I really ramble on at the beginning about the band's history and everything. So this, this is probably going to be a shorter review. But yeah, this one here, the least we can do is wave to each other. I, I decided to review this one second because I'd say it's probably the easiest one to get into. Still a difficult listen, but um, there's a few songs on this album that are just instantaneous. Like You listen to them one time and uh, that's it. You get into it. But the reason I recommend listening to From H to HE before this, even though it's a little bit crazier, a little bit more eccentric and avant-garde, is that the arrangements and the songs are just better written on this album. And don't get me wrong, this album here is, is fantastic. Wouldn't call it a masterpiece, but it's a great album. It's a great addition to your collection. But, you know, it's it's kind of, it kind of falters a bit at points. I mean, there's some songs that are absolutely great, and then some songs that are just good. And there's nothing wrong with something being good, but, you know, on from, from H to H-E, every single song is just a masterpiece from start to finish. And it's just better arranged, better structured, more, more interesting to listen, listen to, more climactic. This one here is just, you know, hit, hit or miss at points. But even the worst songs on this album are still great. So just wanted to give you guys that as a disclaimer. And this one here was probably the last Vandergraaff album I got into. I'd heard uh, Pawn Hearts, Still Life, God Bluff, even before hearing this. And going back to this album at first was kind of a disappointment because it isn't as great as those masterpieces. But over the years, it's grown on me a lot. And now I love it for what it is. Just a great introduction to the band. And, uh... You know, not maybe it doesn't have the greatest song structures, the greatest songwriting, 
but they're getting there. And there are some absolute classics on this album. So I highly, highly recommend it. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into uh, the history behind the album. All right, guys, so the history behind uh, Vandergraaf's first album, the least we can do is wave to each other. Uh, this is kind of be, this is going to be uh, brief. If you guys want to check out, like, you know, something more in-depth about the history behind this band, definitely, again, just go back to that previous video. But yeah, the least we can do is wave to each other. Uh, the first thing you're going to notice is that I keep referring to this as the first Vandergraaf album. But really, technically, it's the second album to bear the Vandergraaf name. The first album, uh, many people know this, but I just thought I'd mention it again, was actually a, a solo album written by Peter Hamill. And he used some of the members of uh, Vandergraaf to kind of act as session, session musicians. And the reason it was labeled as Vandergraaf was because, you know, there was a previous incarnation of the band. And uh, they were set to record an album, but they had all these difficulties with the record company. I'm not going to bore you guys with the details. And Tony Stratton Smith, their manager, made a deal with that shitty record company. I think it was called Mercury Records or something. Whereby, um, whereby if they decided to call this album Vandergraaf Generator, they would get out of that contract and start fresh. So basically, Peter Hamill wrote the album. And, uh, and yeah, the rest is history. They re recorded it and released it as Vandergraaf Generator. Now, if you guys want to check out that album, be my guest. It's called The Aerosol Grey Machine. But uh, it's nowhere near as great as as the stuff that would come. So uh, I'm just warning you guys right there. Many people in the band itself, even Peter Hamill, don't consider it a true Vandergraaf album. Because although Peter Hamill, you know, vocalist, lyricist, one of the best lyricists and uh, composer, extraordinaire, and he really did write a lot of Vandergraaf's music, that band there is really just such a collaborative process between all the members. And uh, especially with the arranging, Hugh Banton and David Jackson played a huge role with the uh, with the arranging of the album. But uh, but yeah, so that album there isn't considered a Vandergraaf album. So they went into the studio, and the lineup at this point was Peter Hamill, vocals, lyricist, composer, as I just said, David Jackson on saxophone, and uh, flutes and other horned instruments. Uh, Hugh Banton on, on organ, the organist extraordinaire, and uh, Guy Evans on drums. And let's not forget, at this point, they did have a bass player named Nick Potter. And later on, uh, specifically halfway through the recording of their second album, he would leave because the band was getting too experimental for him. But uh, we get some good Nick Potter bass on this album. And yeah, the whole that's pretty much the classic lineup with uh, Nick Potter added in there. And, uh, and yeah, so they went into the studio, and this was the first album where they really recorded as a, as a group with the whole collaborative process. And, uh, and yeah, and at that point, I already mentioned they had a manager named Tony Stratton Smith. You guys might have heard of him because he was also the, uh, the manager of Genesis and also their, the leader of their record label, Charisma Records, which he started specifically for Vandergraaf Generator. So, uh, so they got out of that deal with Mercury Records, and now they were fully on board with Tony Stratton Smith's brand new record label, Charisma Records. And uh, so they go into the studio, record the album, and uh, they had a producer named uh, John Anthony at the time. And, you know, apparently uh, the band really liked him. They loved his production work on the album. They really let the band, uh, they really, he really trusted the band's artistic integrity and let them do what they wanted. Didn't really interfere too much, and uh, they actually enjoyed the quality of his production. But when Tony Stratton Smith heard like the, the initial uh, mix of the album, he wasn't impressed. He really didn't like that mix of the album. He thought the production was absolute shit. So uh, he actually got someone else, and I'm forgetting her. I'm forgetting his name now. I think it was like Shell Tammy or something to remix the album. And that was actually the first pressing of the album. And now here's the thing: normally, I always in these videos I always disagree with management. I always disagree with the record label. But in this case, I actually 100% agree. With Tony Stratton Smith. I do think that John Anthony's production on the album, you know, he's a great producer. He produced the next one as well. It was really muddy and everything's kind of muffled in the mix. And to this day, that kind of irritates me. Even with the remastered versions, there are some parts of this album that just sound muddy and unclear to my ears. Anyway, I'm not, you know, any, I'm not like an audiophile or anything, so I can't really describe what I dislike about the production. It just sounds muffled and muddy to me. And some things that I think should be in the forefront are kind of mixed in the back. But uh, I bet you're wondering, like, if they remix the album, how do I know what the original mix sounded like? Well, here's the thing. The band ended up getting their way, and all the all the uh, the pressings released after this album were the John Anthony mix. So that Tammy Smith or whatever the fuck his name was, uh, Shell Talmy, fuck, I'm already forgetting. 
I was only the first pressing of the album. So if you have that pressing of the album, consider it a collector's item because it's probably pretty rare at this point. But yeah, so uh, they released the album and it actually did pretty well in the charts. There was a, a hit single on the album called Refugees or maybe it wasn't a hit single, but it did crack into the charts. And uh, the album did pretty well for the band. Got good reviews. They were off to a good start. And uh, a lot of the critics were kind of calling them the next King Crimson because again, this album is very... Uh, very challenging musically, very complex, especially compared to a lot of the other bands at this time. Again, you got to remember, this was 1970. So yes, in Genesis and uh, other bands, they were around at this point, but uh, they weren't really at the height of their game. So this album here must have been a really nice surprise for a lot of the, uh, the critics at the time, uh, looking for something more adventurous after King Crimson's amazing debut album. So yeah, it did pretty well in the charts. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention about the making of this album, other than the uh, the production, is that these guys were actually well ahead of schedule in the making of it. So uh, they had a few extra days, and Nick Potter decided to pick up an electric guitar, an instrument he hadn't even played before in his life, and uh, decided to lay down some electric guitar tracks on the album. So uh, that's kind of a, an intriguing thing about the album, and kind of shows how Nick Potter... Was a, was a pretty creative guy, so you get a little bit of electric guitar. And again, King Crimson wasn't a band known for their guitar playing. Again, on later albums, especially World Record, we do get some long stretches of electric guitar and some guest appearances from Robert Fripp. But uh, for the most part, they were a very sax and organ-driven band. And again, speaking of the saxophone, this was the first album to feature David Jackson, who uh, really is probably the most, other than Peter Hamill, probably the most unique member of Vandergraaff, which gives him that signature sound with his violent double sax playing inspired by the jazz legend Roland Kirk. This guy would literally play a tenor and alto sax at the same time, which is freaking incredible and gives the band that, that heavy kind of, uh, you know, violent edge to it. And again, his playing was so violent that he would sometimes shield his kids away from the compositions he was writing. At one point, a friend came over and they were playing this album. And uh, he stopped the album at the song White Hammer because that, that's a pretty frightening song. And uh, he was scared that his kids would, you know, freak the fuck out from that. So if that doesn't, doesn't show how dark and insane this band is, then nothing really will. So, uh, so yeah, they released the album, did pretty well. And it's, it's funny to think that this album here was the only one that really cracked the charts in the UK in their entire run. Uh, for the rest of their career, they, were, they made it huge in Italy which is amazing, and I have a lot of pride from that, because I am, my background is Italian, but uh, they never really had much success in the U.S. or the U.K., and in fact, uh, their debut album, Aerosol Grey Machine, was only released in the U.S., which is extremely strange, but yeah, this one here did get a U.K. release, and you know, a worldwide release, if you want to call it that, and it does, does have a remaster, but I don't think the remaster job is that fantastic, to be honest, but again, you can't really fix crap <laughs> in terms of the production. So yeah, guys, that's pretty much all I got to say about the history behind the album. They went on tour afterwards, uh, a pretty well-received tour. They really cultivated a cult following at this point. And, uh, and yeah, and it was looking good for the band. So uh, really their first major stepping stone into the arena of progressive rock. So now let's get into the overall review. All right, guys, so let's talk about the overall review. Uh, damn, it got dark pretty fast out here. Anyway, I'm going to try to keep it down because... Uh, I don't want to wake up the neighbors or anything, but but yeah, so this album here, first let's talk about the quality of it. What do I think about this album? Again, I want to get this out of the way that this is a great album, okay? There's nothing wrong with it, and sorry if I come across as negative, but I'm going to be comparing this to the albums that come. So again, I can't help but be negative when the next four albums this band released in a row are all progressive rock masterpieces. I mean, if you haven't heard the four albums after this, you absolutely have to. They're essential. Okay, again, they might be hard to get into. You might have to take a bit of time to really sit down and appreciate them, but they are essential. This one here, on the other hand, it's great. It's a great addition to the collection, but it is an essential. But you really see where the band's coming from, and it is such a mature album, such a fully realized statement by the band. But, uh, but again, they would improve, and they would improve quite a bit over the years. So the first thing you're going to notice about this album is that it has a lot of the key characteristics of Van der Graaff generated. The songs are very dark. Peter Hamill's vocals are uh, eccentric, insane, and dramatic at points. And, uh, you know, we got David Jackson's violent saxophones all over this thing, Hugh Banton's organ. So it really does have a lot of the classic elements of Van der Graaff generated, but just a little bit watered down compared to what would come later. Uh, Peter Hamill, even his vocals, they're fantastic. 
but he puts a little bit more into it. He puts a little bit more passion on the next few albums, especially tracks like House With No Door and, uh, you know, Lost and things like that on, on the following album. And then Pawn Hearts is just, man, it just hits me right here. It's just a very passionate album. This one here, he does give it a lot of energy and a fantastic performance, but we don't really get those goosebump-inducing, passionate moments. And that's debatable. A lot of people would say Refugees is one of their most passionate, heartfelt songs. I love the song, but I disagree. I think, you know, later on, they they would get a lot more passion. So that that's one thing I want to mention. And, uh, you know, now that I think about it, one other major thing I want to get across about this album is uh, the lyricism by Peter Hamill. Now, if you've seen my last video, you know I consider Peter Hamill to be one of the all-time greatest lyricists in progressive rock. And the reason is because he really touches on the human condition like no other progressive rock band really did. And uh, again, he's coming from that singer-songwriter kind of background, so it's easy to see how he melded that into the band. And uh, he touches on some really dark subject matter later on in, in, uh, in Vandergraaf's career, but more dealing with the human side of it, the human emotion, the human psyche, and all the problems that we struggle with. On this album here, the major difference is he deals with a bit of that. Again, the song Refugees deals with the struggle of losing friends and things like that. But for the most part, this album is more in the vein of just your general prog rock kind of stuff. The, the song Darkness 1111 is really philosophical. Uh, deals with, like, you know, the dark side of humanity or whatever. I don't really know what it's about, to be honest. And then you got tra tracks like White Hammer, which deal with the witch hunts. After the Flood, which deals with an apocalypse and whatever Robert would have said, which deals with who the fuck knows, to be honest. Uh, it's just not a very human album. It's kind of cold, and the themes really don't touch on that human side. So that's another thing I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of about this album. But again, uh, I can't complain. Like, it's awesome. It's just one thing I thought I'd mention. Also, uh, Hugh Banton's organ on this album is all over the place. He definitely seems to be the standout member of the band. At this point, or on later albums, it will be a perfect balance between him and David Jackson. Now, David Jackson does have some incredible moments of, again, extremely eccentric and violent saxophone playing. But compared to later albums, he's a little bit more subdued. And Hugh Banton's organ really takes center stage here. And again, Hugh Banton, as an organist, he has this very uh, church-like quality to his playing, giving the album this really gothic vibe. So if you're into that kind of stuff, uh, you're absolutely going to love this album. But, uh, and, he, and David Jackson's saxophone has less of a swing to it, less of a jazzy touch than on later albums. Here, it's just he just comes blaring in full force at points. And uh, his flute playing is great as well. He adds some nice flute playing to the albums. It gives it a nice pastoral touch. And, uh, and yeah, so, and another thing I should mention is that they had a few guest musicians on the albums. Uh, a nice cello player. On, on the song Refugees. Yeah, and the funny thing is, I always thought it was David Jackson playing the sax. I mean, sorry, playing the cello on that song. But no, it's this other guy named, uh, I think, Mike Horowitz, who must have been just a session musician. But uh, yeah, he totally makes that song. Great playing on the track. And yeah, so in terms of the performances, those are the main differences. Hugh Banton is definitely taking more of a central role here. Not that he, you know, he wasn't taking a central role on the other albums. But on this album here, he really stands out as kind of like the main instrumentalist. But David Jackson does come in with his crazy saxophone. Peter Hamill's vocal performance, a little bit more subdued than uh, later albums. And again, if you listen to the song After the Flood, you're going to think I'm fucking insane calling it subdued. But you have to compare it to the other albums coming up. So in comparison. Now, in terms of the music itself. Uh, I mentioned that this album here had a lot of those signature moments of Vandergraaf Generator. It's a very dark album. But the thing is, it has moments of lightness to break it up. Again, I mentioned the track Refugees. There's a song out of this book on side two, which is very light and airy. And just really doesn't feel like it belongs on the album. Now, I'm all for variety. I love when an album has variety. But uh, when Vandergraaf Generator would do ballads later on, they did have this sinister edge that really kept... Uh, kept things consistent between their more out there eccentric tracks and their, you know, more laid back moments. There was that touch of that little sinister edge there. On this album here, we have these light, pretty ballads like Refugees and uh, Out of This Book that just frankly feel kind of out of place for Vandergraaf Generator. And again, that's just my opinion. But when this band hits hard on this album, they hit hard with the dark and ominous Darkness 1111. That's right, there's a track called Darkness on this album, as well as White Hammer and uh, Bits and Pieces of After the Flood. So those songs there are really the three that show where the band were headed. 
There's a track called uh, Whatever Robert Would Have Said on side two. That, you know, it's a little weird. It has like a little bit of psychedelia going on, the electric guitar. And again, it just doesn't really fit in with what Vandergraaf Generator would do later. But it's a decent song. So again, the album's a little bit unbalanced. I would say side one is definitely the stronger side than side two. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the compositions on this album. They definitely got a lot better on the next album with how to arrange and compose songs. And here's the thing I want to mention. So I mentioned Peter Hamill composed most of the tracks, but the whole, it was really a collaborative process. The whole band really collaborated on how to arrange the different components and uh, write the different musical sections of the tracks. And Hugh Banton definitely took a prominent role later on. But on this album here, you feel that it's slightly lacking in comparison to the next few. Uh, usually the songs are pretty straightforward and structured in comparison. Like the song Darkness 1111 really just has those two major themes going throughout it. As well as Refugees really staying in the same place for most of the track. White Hammer has two main sections. Whereas later gen um, Van der Graaff songs would have just multiple sections. Just jarring and... Uh, you know, not jarring, but seamless transitions at points, and jarring ones as well that work, and uh, really a lot going on, a lot packed into the tracks. This album here is a little bit more simplistic on the arrangement, on the compositional side. Uh, there is one exception, After the Flood, the, la the closing 11-minute epic on the album. They were trying to get ambitious with the song's arrangement, but ultimately, it does feel a bit choppy, it does feel a little bit, you know, jumpy from here to there. The transition or transitions aren't as great. And uh, the whole arrangement of the song just leaves something else to be desired. And I'm trying not to be hypocritical because the, the song Pioneers Over Sea on the next album also kind of goes through the same thing. But for some reason it works. Like the whole atmosphere and vibe of that song allows for those jarring and crazy transitions. But after the flood, I would have liked a little bit more, more seamlessness to it. So that's one criticism I would have of it. And again, sorry if I'm sounding critical. I do love the album. And yeah, those are pretty much the main points I want to make about the album. Uh, there's a few songs that kind of feel out of place, and the songwriting is great, but it's not there yet. But you know, when it hits hard, it really hits hard, guys. There's some absolutely fantastic moments on the album. And uh, again, side one is absolutely great. So that, you at least have one amazing side of music to latch onto. Side two is a little bit eh, hit or miss here and there, but still pretty decent. So that's uh, what I think about the album overall. A very gothic, dark album with some lighter moments that feel out of place here and there, but overall really solid. So now let's get into the album track by track. All right, guys, so kickstarting the album, we get the aptly titled Darkness 1111. And if you guys weren't sure what the 1111 stood for, basically it's just a, a timestamp on the song. It was written on November 11th, 1968, or at least the initial ideas of the song were written back then. So uh, Peter Hamill, again, 1968, two years before the release of this album, was already penning these very dark compositions. And uh, this track here, for me, it's just a Van der Graaff Generator classic. Definitely the most, um, other than After the Flood in terms of the composition, in terms of atmosphere and mood, this is definitely the track that really fits in and uh, really br uh, sounds a lot like what Van der Graaff Generator would do. And it's an absolute classic Uh Man, David Jackson just absolutely steals the show on this track. Every member of the band is fantastic, but really, this is really his shining moment on the entire thing. And his sax is absolutely aggressive, absolutely violent, and really sends shivers up and down my spine. This is one of the all-time best Van der Graaff songs, and it just opens perfectly. You get the wind howling in your ears. And, you know, I, I criticize the production of the song, but this part here is actually fantastic. Very fitting. And then we get this droning kind of Gregorian chant in the background. I don't even know if it's an actual voice or just an effect on uh, Hugh Banton's organs. The dude had a lot of effects on his fucking organs, to say the least. But it's awesome. You have this medieval, oh, uh, kind of chant in the background. And combined with that wind, that wind sound effect, it's just whew, very creepy. This is a very Halloween-themed track. Definitely play this song on Halloween and you'll feel it. Uh, then we get... Hugh Banton's organ coming in. It sounds very kind of cliche 70s horror movie, Dracula-style organ playing. Really cool stuff there. No sax to be heard yet. And then uh, Peter Hamill comes in. He's almost like whispering in your ear. His vocals are kind of mixed so that he's whispering into your left ear. And it's, it, again, it's just very unsettling and very spine-chilling at that point. But uh, what I love about this track is it builds up and the sax comes in. When that sax kicks in, it's absolutely fantastic. And the whole song just swells up to this powerful moment. And I love how Peter Hamill kind of holds that last note. And it gets more distorted and more intense as that note progresses. 
And really, it's just this one note that he holds that gives this whole song this disturbing atmosphere. And then right when that note finishes, bam, we get David Jackson coming in with his blaring saxophone with the... And this is the first time he's really using the, the double sax at the same time. How fitting for the first track on the album. Just spearheading the way to come. And it's just an absolutely powerful moment. Just incredible. And that kind of that kind of alternates with the intro of the track in terms of the vocals and uh, really it's just those two major themes of the track: the subdued organ part and the blaring in your face climactic sax solo, which is really cool. Then uh, Hugh Banton goes into overdrive and really plays this atmosphere, extremely distorted organ. I hesitate to call it a solo, and uh, it's just absolutely great. And one major thing about this track that you really got to mention is Nick Potter's classic bass line that really drives and propels the entire thing. Man, his bass playing on this track, if I had to pick one Vandergraaf Generator song where he really shines, it, it would have to be this one. I mean, his bass is really an integral moment of the entire song. And uh, yeah, on the rest of the album, he's good as well, but this is where he really shines. Then we get back to the main section of the track, and really the the highlight of this whole song for me is the outro, where David Jackson is just going absolutely nuts. His sax is aggressive as fuck, almost piercing in your ears, and extremely distorted, and it really shines through. Very, very ominous and uh, insane outro of the track. In terms of the production, I gotta say, guys, this always bothered me. This song just sounds extremely muddy, whether it be Peter Hamill's vocals in your ear, the organ at the at the end of the song not really shining through. Or just the saxophone just sounding kind of buried in the mix when it should be at the forefront during that blaring atmos uh, that blaring triumphant section. There's just a few quirks with the production on this track that always bothered me and prevented it from being one of my all-time favorite Vandergraaf songs. I, I feel like if they made everything clearer on this track, this would really stand out, especially when that triumphant sax comes in. So it could have been better in terms of the production. So for that reason, I'm not going to give it a 10 out of 10. It's not quite at that level, but it's definitely a 9 to a 9.5, somewhere in that region. Uh, probably the best song on the album, and uh, really the song that shows the dark and ominous nature, the gothic nature of a future Van der Graaf. So excellent track. Uh, then we get the second track on the album, Refugees, the big hit from the album, and uh, probably the most well-known Van der Graaf song. If you go on Spotify, you see their top... Uh, most listened to songs. This is definitely number one. And uh, it's ironic because this is probably one of the least Vandergraaf style songs they ever put out. It's a very beautiful, classically inspired ballad. Uh, again, when I say beautiful, I really mean it. Peter Hamill's just singing on this track is really pretty, really light and delicate. And uh, the whole cello and flute kind of unison with uh, David Jackson on flute and that other dude on, on cello just create this beautiful... Uh, classical atmosphere and it's it's just really nice uh you do get the organ joining in at the two minute 35 second mark or somewhere around there which adds a little bit of that powerful kick to it a little bit of sax later on as well and uh some gothic chanting in the background kind of like the opening of darkness but uh overall it's a very very light song not an, an ounce of sinister nature to it and really this track is a shout out to peter hamill's flatmates mike and Susie. i don't know their last names who he shared a room with back in the day, and then they ended up moving to California or uh, somewhere like that, somewhere in the States, leaving them all alone. And this song's really dealing with the loss of, you know, these good friends who he never really connected with again. So later on in the track, if you're com confused by the lyrics where he says, Mike and Susie, that's, oh, the air conditioner's kicking in, so don't mind that. Uh, but yeah, anyway, when he mentions Mike and Susie at the end there, that's uh, what he's referring to. So don't get too confused there. But yeah, it's a really, really well-produced song as well. Compared to Darkness 1111, everything is really clear. Everything just stands out. It's just a very melancholic but hopeful track as well. So it's a, it's a feel-good song. Again, it doesn't really fit in with the album, especially coming after Darkness 1111, which was this brooding, violent song. This track here is the complete opposite. And again, I'm a fan of variety on albums, but this song here... I don't know. There's just something about it that uh, coming after Darkness 1111, I feel like maybe this should have been later on on the album, just to let you catch your breath after that track, or at least ease you into the lighter stuff on the album, but really good song, really powerful at points, especially that when that organ kicks in, it's fantastic. 
So Refugees, as you guys could probably tell, I'm a little bit more critical of the song compared to most people, but I do consider it a great song. I wouldn't say it's the greatest Vandergraaff song. Uh, if you go on Prague Archives, you'll see a lot of people praising this as one of their greatest songs. I don't know. I don't see it. It's a beautiful ballad. A lot of highlights on the song, and it's way, way above average. So let's get that straight. But best Vandergraaff song? I doubt it. Uh, again, I much prefer the song House Is No Door, which is the ballad on the next album. Uh, that really touches my soul. This one here is just kind of like this easy listening song that has a lot of powerful moments to it. So I got to give it credit for that. And overall, it's just really good. I would give it a 9 out of 10. I really like it that much. And again, I'm going to come across as negative, but I do really love these songs. But yeah, great track, easily a 9 out of 10 getting a little chilly out there so decided to come indoors uh so we're back in the in the zone here guys and yeah we're on track three now white hammer which is basically a track about the malaeus maleficarum and if you guys are wondering what that is it was basically this papal order that was issued from the vatican i think back in the 1400s 1486 to be uh to be exact as peter hamill really hammers down in the lyrics um that basically issued an order to hunt down torture and kill all witches and you know all black magic and black arts and everything basically the song just delves into that so a pretty dark song and a pretty good one as well it's eight minutes in length it closes out side one of the album and uh you know although it isn't quite as as uh, as great as darkness 11 11 the opening track it's awesome and really the last two to three minutes of the track are where things really get doomy and ominous and Honestly, sinister. Sinister as fuck. And the first six minutes of the track are pretty good as well. But overall, just not as strong as uh, as Darkness 1111. But yeah, a very uh, with this track here, we're definitely going back into the insane darkness that the opening track started on the album. Uh, literally a hundred light years away from the, the prettiness of Refugees. So yeah, White Hammer, pretty cool song. Again, it's kind of a song of two halves, or I should say, you know, there's like a six minute section that kind of stays with the same melody, the same theme. And then the last two minutes of the song go off into this grand finale. So the first six minutes of the track, pretty good. Again, heavily dominated by the organ. It kicks off with Hugh Banton laying down this haunting church organ line. And then Peter Hamill comes in and really describes the details behind the Malaeus Maleficarum. Again, he mentions the exact year, 1486. And you get some like proclamatory trumpet in the background, almost like... It's actually It actually works pretty well. It almost gives you the vibe of the Pope actually delivering this decree to the people with that with that uh, proclamation with the trumpet in the background. Pretty cool. Uh, and again, Peter Hamill, I feel that his vocals here don't really gel with the music in the background as well as I'd like it to. So that's kind of one thing I'll criticize about the song. But uh, before you know it, it locks into this, this pretty awesome groove with the organ and the bass kicking in. And Peter Hamill, I love how he extends the notes right at the end of uh, the transition to this part, where he really, really holds a note, and it gets more distorted and more sinister as the note progresses. Really cool, really like that. And then before you know it, the sax comes in, and it actually has a little bit of swing to it. I mentioned earlier on the album, his sax is always just blaring in your ears, and doesn't have much of that jazzy swing. Well, this part here is an exception, and uh, it's pretty nice. Like It's the only time the sax does it on the album, but I, I like that part there. It's nice and jazzy. And overall... You know, there isn't much sax on the song, or at least in the first six minutes. Uh, it kind of just, it's kind of just there during that, that swing in section, which doesn't last very long. But before that, we always go back to the main theme, which is really driven by the organ and bass. So it kind of does that for a few minutes, about five minutes of the track. It gets a little bit repetitive for my likings. It doesn't really change up too much. So uh, that's another criticism I have of it. But then at the five minute mark the the sax section comes in again with the the swinging vibe to it and it goes on a bit longer than it did in the past and it goes into this nice kind of one minute stretch of saxophone which is really cool uh i really like that part again i wish there was a little bit more sax in the first five minutes of the track then at the six minute mark it kind of winds down and we only hear organ and then all of a sudden this is where all hell breaks loose guys we get this heavy distorted hammond organ coming in and holy fuck, guys, Hugh Banton sounds absolutely evil during this section of the song. It, it, it literally is the sound of impending doom. And I totally see why David Jackson didn't want to play this song when his kids were around. Because this would scare the shit out of me when I was a kid. Then before you know it, fuck, guys, David Jackson sax comes in. And it is blaring. It is absolutely doom metal. 
incarnate in the form of saxophone and organ. I mean, this is probably the doomiest track of the time. Doomier than Black Sabbath's debut album, which came out in that, that same month of the same year. It's fucking insane. Some of the heaviest shit I ever heard in my life coming out, you know, before heavy metal was even a thing. So definitely one of the highlights of the album. It sounds absolutely tortured, which I guess is what the whole song was going for, trying to embody the torture that these innocent people were going through, uh, who were thought to be witches by the papacy and, you know, the Spanish Inquisition and things like that. It's it's just an absolutely fantastic effect. It just builds and builds into absolute chaos and uh, absolutely torturing to the ears, to the heart, and to the soul. It, it's awesome. By far the best part of the song. you got to love that grand finale. And probably if I had to pinpoint my favorite section of the whole album, that would be the point right there. It's absolutely incredible. So overall, I'm going to give this, strong, uh, this song a strong 9 out of 10. Uh, if it didn't have that last two minutes, it would probably be an 8.5, but it does. So, uh, yeah, it's a 9 out of 10 for me, guys. All right, guys, so now we get into side two of the album. And kicking things off, we got the very strangely titled, Whatever Would Robert Have Said? And uh, the Robert that they're talking about in this song is apparently Robert Van de Graaff, the creator of the Van de Graaff generator. Not Van der Graaff, Van de Graaff. They, they actually unintentionally misspelled his name. And uh, later when they found out that his name was Van de Graaff with D-E, they just kept their, their fuck up. Not that it really matters anyway, because this song actually isn't really about Robert Van de Graaff in terms of the lyrics. And to be honest, no one really knows what this song's even about. To this day, Peter Hamill still doesn't really know what the hell he was getting at with these lyrics. And uh, I guess that's the first thing I want to mention about it. The first criticism I have is, again, this is one of these tracks here on the album. That uh, don't really hit close to home. Don't really talk about the human condition like the next few uh, Vandergraaff albums. And uh, you can't really make that personal connection with it. So it really just leaves you cold in terms of the lyrics and vocals. And again, I hate to harp on the lyrics so much. But for me, Peter Hamill, he's one of my favorite lyricists. And I think his lyrics add so much to the music. Uh, in contrast to other rock bands where I'm mostly just focusing on the music. With Vandergraaff Generator, the lyrics are really important for me. So that's why I'm kind of putting it under a microscope a little more than my usual reviews. But uh, but yeah, that's the, the first thing I want to mention about the track. But anyway, uh, this track here, guys, it's a strange one. It seems to really tear up a lot of the fan base of uh, Vandergraaff. If you look at reviews of the album on Prague Archives, you'll see that a lot of people really praise this as one of the best songs on the album. And then others say it's one of the weaker points. I don't know why it's so divisive, but there's just something about this track that seems to divide fans. And usually, I, I usually take the middle ground. And although I do like the song, I will, I do kind of lean towards the fans that say that this is one of the weaker tracks on the album. It's just, for me, it's kind of a forgettable track. And I don't know what it is. It's just, I've heard it so many times. I've heard this album, like, literally, like, shitloads of times. And this track here always kind of, it just comes and goes for me. I don't know what it is. And I like the individual components of the song. But somehow, it just feels like when they put all these components together, it just doesn't work as a whole. And really what I think it comes down to is um, a few things. Well, for first of all, Peter Hamill, for me, his vocal performance just doesn't have that passion, doesn't have that emotion that he normally delivers. And it's a good, it's a good vocal performance, don't get me wrong. But um, I don't know, he doesn't really have that, that power to his voice that you'd expect from a Vandergraaff song. And uh, secondly, it's, it's notable for having prominent uh, electric guitar, uh, played by Nick Potter, which I actually kind of like. It has a Robert Fripp kind of atonal feel to it, but uh, I don't know. There's just there's just something about it that doesn't really gel with the vocals of the track that uh, kind of leaves like a bitter taste in my mouth. But there are a lot of positives to this track, so don't get me wrong. The opening is fantastic with the organ and sax coming in, and Guy Evans absolutely pounding the crap out of his drums. Again, Guy Evans is such a fantastic drummer. I feel like I don't talk about him enough. But he's just a very intricate, complex guy like a like a Bill Bruford or a Phil Collins that perfectly suits the music of Vandergraaff. So really great intro, and that's a good like minute and a half section of the track. Then Peter Hamill comes in with his vocals and the acoustic guitar, and he kind of has like this soft feel to his voice. And then when the electric guitar winds in, he sounds a little bit more sinister. And just when you start feeling it, it goes into this weird, jarring, kind of upbeat, up-tempo section with the... And it just doesn't work with the track. It just clashes against everything that the song was leading up to. You'd expect something more passionate. You wouldn't expect this kind of playful, jarring, um, up-tempo section there. So I think that's the main thing that I just can't get past with this track. That's kind of my main roadblock for me not enjoying the song. But, uh... 
But yeah, like overall, other than that, it, it's pretty good. And it re- kind of repeats that melody. Then at the three minute section, we get a beautiful, awesome section of the track. The song just quiets down and it's just basically sax and organ. We get this nice kind of, not free form, but this atmospheric solo by David Jackson on the sax. It's absolutely wonderful. And then the organ starts building up and everything starts accelerating and going out of hand. And this would have been the perfect opportunity to really shoot the song into the stratosphere, really do something exciting. But ultimately, it just comes crashing back to the original theme that Peter Hamill was singing. And uh, it was kind of a disappointment for me. You know, I was expecting it to really go off and do something, give you one of those spine-chilling wow factor moments, like the ending of White Hammer or, uh, you know, those when the sax comes blaring in on Darkness 1111. But you don't get that with this track. So, uh, so yeah, pretty hit or miss. Overall, the strong sax solo in the middle, the amazing intro with Guy Evans drummings, and um, just, the, for the most part, decent Peter Hamill performance. Make it strong enough for me to give this an 8 to an 8.5 out of 10, but I wouldn't give it anything higher than that. So, uh, kind of a missed opportunity on the album, but still a, a good listen. So keeping with the theme of side one, the second track of side two is also a flute-driven ballad. This one is called Out of My Book, and it was actually written by David Jackson, co-written by Peter Hamill, so that's pretty unique. Usually Peter Hamill composes the main structures of these songs, but this one was actually composed by uh, Peter Jack- uh, David Jackson. Sorry, <laughs> I feel like I've been calling him Peter Jackson this whole time. I don't know. I gotta go back and edit this. But anyway, this track here is a really... Uh, it really stands out like a sore thumb on the album, kind of like Refugees, but this one here is nowhere as great as Refugees. It's overly beautiful, overly pretty, and again, even with lyrics like running along in sunlight meadows, it's just it's just jarring coming after dark tracks such as Darkness 1111 and, uh, and White Hammer, especially White Hammer. It, it, it's kind of jarring, and to be honest, guys, this song really doesn't do much for me. I'd say from Vandergraaf Generator's classic period, uh, this album up to world record. This is probably my least favorite Vandergraaf song, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a beautiful flute-driven ballad, uh, but it just it just leaves more to be desired. N- nothing really special. So I guess that's the the most I can say about it. Also, the production. I also have to pick on the production a bit on this track. We got Peter Hamill's vocals uh, singing in one ear. So again, they mixed his vocals to come in one ear, and then the flute, acoustic guitar, and all that other shit going on in the other ear, and you know, both of them, and it feels like Peter Hamill's vocals are kind of buried in the mix at points, the flute kind of bombards you, and it's really prominent, it's really high up in the mix, and uh, I feel like they should have toned down the flute just a little bit, and let Peter Hamill's vocals really shine, because this really is an acoustic singer-songwriter kind of track, uh, but yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit bombarding to the senses at points there, with the, with the flute in the background, so, uh, and the organ, got some organ in there too as well, so yeah, out of my book, tough to give it a rating. Probably I'd give it a 7.5 to an 8. So an average song. I wouldn't say it's above average by any means, but uh, not very offensive. All right, guys, so then closing off the album, we get the long, epic 12-minute track. The, the first epic of Vandergraaf history, After the Flood, an absolutely apocalyptic song. And, uh, you know, a song that has so many fucking strong moments uh, I, I absolutely love the individual components of this track, but again, it suffers from the same kind of thing I was talking about earlier, where the band really, they grew so much in terms of how, how they arranged the song. The arrangement of this song definitely needs work. You go from like these dark apocalyptic sections to these jarring acoustic pastoral passages at the blink of an eye, and it just creates this jarring listening experience, and I feel like the band really should have you know, honed down their arranging skills a little bit better for this song, made it more of a seamless flow to it, but it does feel choppy, it does feel jarring at points, but again, the individual sections are fantastic, and the outro is absolutely incredible, so got a lot of good things to say about this track, uh, it's not my favorite on the album, you'll hear a lot of people praising this as the best track, I, I really do think Darkness 1111 is just a more cohesive and better written song, as well as maybe even Refugees, uh, and White Hammer, I put this song on par with White Hammer, let's just put it that way. But yeah, really apocalyptic track, and uh, I'll walk you through the highlights. So it starts off with this organ, uh, organ, acoustic guitar, and sax part, really uh, building up the first main theme of the track, with the... It's actually pretty light and pretty pretty airy compared to uh, what would come later in the track, but it's a pretty good theme. Then we get 
Uh, I like how, how when they say there's a far distant rumble, when Peter Hamill says that line, you actually do hear a, a distant rumble in the background. So that's a pretty good effect there on the music. Pretty nice dramatic effect. Uh, but then all of a sudden we get into this heavy Hammond organ section and, and sax. And this is what I really like about the song. When it gets to these heavy, dark sections, it really gives you that apocalyptic feel. And you're thinking, yeah, fuck yeah, the song's going to accelerate and build up into madness. But sadly, that that heavy section ends. And we get, get into this kind of melodic section driven by the sax, which kind of feels like, okay, you know, we already had kind of a melodic acoustic intro. The song should be going into the stratosphere. But again, it dials it back. It just sends you into this melodic frame of mind. And then the whole thing kind of stops and we get Peter Hamill singing these really creepy lines. The ice is turning to water. And we got these effects on his vocals and it's really haunting. Then, and this is only, this is before the two minute mark. Because at the one minute 40 second mark, we get the main theme of the track, which I absolutely love. The one where he sings, the water rushes over all. It's this awesome, uplifting, and really powerful section of the song that really jars with the lyrics. Because the lyrics are just talking about literally the annihilation of the human race by this fucking flood. But uh, it's just really uplifting and melodic. And I absolutely love that theme of the track. And I like how it jars with the lyrics and clashes with the theme of the song. So pretty cool. And, you know, you, you think that's going to play out, but before you know it, again, another another jarring transition back to the melodic intro of the song. And it kind of reprises that structure a bit. Uh, oh, my oven's going off. Have to put in some pizzas. Uh, anyway, that could wait. Actually, maybe not. Let me pause it. Okay, sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, we were talking about how it reprises the original opening structure of the track. But then before you know it, we get another change up where we get this flute section. I get this, guys, reprising King Crimson's 21st Century Schizoid Man. They throw in a little homage to Robert Fripp there, and there's no way that this isn't a homage to Robert Fripp, because that is just straight out of Schizoid Man, and it's a nice little section of the track there. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. I actually like how they, they pay tribute to their, I guess what would be considered their heroes, the first progressive rock band, uh, or contemporaries. But yeah, I, I like that part right there. Then it gets into the main theme of the track again with the water and blah, blah, blah. And uh, again, at the 4 minute 50 second mark, this part here I really like from the track. It's this nice 2 minute chunk of just heavy apocalyptic freak, freak out. Kind of like the ending of White Hammer. And I, I think that's awesome. It builds up with the sax and organ. I find that the organ, again, is just too high in the mix. I want to hear that eccentric sax just blaring in my fucking ears. But the, org the sharp organ just kind of takes over. But... Nonetheless, a nice two-minute, just crazy section that, again, on first listen, you might need some time to get into that, but I think that really embodies the whole feel of the track. And then it ends with the uh, acoustic guitar coming in, and I feel like this is just one of the worst transitions ever. Like, it just, it's not a smooth transition from this apocalyptic section into this gentle acoustic guitar. Uh, it's just absolutely strange. But I do love the lyrics on this section where Peter Hamill says... Every step appears to be an unavoidable consequence of the preceding one. I think that's a really profound statement. And I think a quote from Albert Einstein that really shows that, you know, all our actions kind of pile up as a human race. And uh, one day, you never know, guys, this might actually happen. So great track there. Uh, it reprises that apocalyptic section for a bit. But uh, then it just dives right back into the original theme. Again, a lot of reprises on this song. And I feel like some of them are unnecessary. I think the song should have just progressed and done different things. But they keep bringing it back to that original that original theme. But uh, yeah, not too bad. What I really love about the track is that at the 8 minute 40 second mark, we get the that main section of the track again with the The water rushes over all. But they really let that play out and extend right to the end of the 12 minute runtime which is really nice, and it gets really climactic. The electric guitar joins forces, and it's really nice playing, and they let it ride out and let it breathe, which is what I really like about the last few minutes of the track. I just wish that the main body of the song let the sections breathe a little bit more, maybe a, a, a bit less reprises and jarring transitions. But yeah, needless to say, the ending of this track is awesome, and one of my favorite Vandergraaff moments, especially on this album. Uh, it's a very powerful moment there. And yeah, so this track here, again, it really shows Vandergraaff going into more uh, ambitious territory. They really wanted to create multi-part epics. This, they were just getting their feet wet with this song, but on the next album, they would really hone down their arranging skills and actually make it work. 
But, you know, for the strength of this, the ending of the song alone and all those apocalyptic sections in the middle, I would easily give this still a 9 out of 10. So still a fantastic track. Just Vandergraaf trying to go into more experimental territory and uh, failing a little bit, but uh, for the most part, good track. And yeah, that closes out the album, guys. So again, I just want to summarize this album here. It's a little bit more accessible than their future albums, but just not as well executed. So that's why I kind of hesitate to say to start off with this one. It might be easy to get into with songs like Refugees and uh, Out of My Book and maybe even Darkness 1111 because that, that song there doesn't really demand too much from the listener and it does stay within the same theme for, throughout most of the track. You might have a bit of trouble when it comes to whatever Robert would have said in this one, which are a little bit more scattered, a little bit more all over the place. But uh, for the most part, it is a little bit more accessible. But I would still say listen to From H to H-E first and then go back to this one later. In my opinion. But still a great album, guys. Overall, so many good songs. Darkness 1111, just a standout from start to finish. White Hammer's outro, one of the strongest moments. Refugees, a beautiful song. And this one here, really ambitious, really shows the future direction of the band. And uh, has an amazing outro. So overall, I would definitely recommend listening to it. A very strong album. But again, I'm going to say this one more time. In I'm comparing it to their later work, which is far superior. So... Thanks again for watching, guys. Definitely, definitely stay tuned for more Vandergraaf reviews. If you like Vandergraaf Generator, I'm going to be reviewing all of their albums eventually, so stay tuned for that. I might take a little bit a little bit of a break after Pawn Hearts and then go into the second part of their 70s career later on, which is my favorite personally, or at least tied with like Pawn Hearts and From H to H-E. But yeah, we'll see what happens. Anyway, guys, as always, thank you again. I appreciate it. Peace out and rock on.